So in the second uh, video lesson of uh, theme number 12, uh, we will look at the so-called probit and logit models, uh, which could be commonly called uh, binary response models. But perhaps this term probit and logit are more, more commonly known, so I'll, I'll use them in the title. So firstly, what is the idea of the, of the binary response models? So it's si similar to the situation that we call, called earlier dummy variables. So now the situation is that we have this, our dependent variable y as this kind of binary zero, zero and one. So uh, this is common in so-called discrete choice modeling in economics. That for example, if you want to, want to explain what kind of factors influence that whether, whether a person owns a car or rather uses public transportation, then in this kind of uh, choice of transportation, then the dependent variable could be coded as the as for example one equal to so y equal to one when person owns a car and zero if does not own a car. So of course this kind of situation occurs in many 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 other contexts. So in general we refer to these kind of models as binary response models. And uh, of course this binary response can be can be anything but the uh, but the point here is that uh, it is now this uh, uh, dependent variable y that it takes zeros and one, whereas in dummy variables, it's always the exponentary variables x that have the zero, one data. But like in the case of dummy variables, of course, there can be a lot of, lot of uh, situations where the, where the dependent variable y could be, could be binary. So it's interesting to then uh, also, also consider this possibility because there can be many, many practical applications. So the situation is somewhat different now when, when, when the dependent variable is, is uh, binary and, and also perhaps somewhat more complicated than in the case of the dummy variables. So to gain some understanding, let's uh, first uh, phrase it so-called uh, latent regression. So this uh, term latent we already came to in this context of panel data, uh, meaning that it's something that is unobserved, but it's uh, influencing uh, um, underlying this, uh, this our, our model. So now suppose that, uh, that actually this uh, choice of whether, whether this uh, um, binary response gets value of zero or one is, is based on, the, uh, on, on some kind of rational choice mechanism that, and it depends on this kind of latent uh, uh, y asterisk, which you can think about the like net benefit so if if I follow this uh, previous example that I mentioned that uh, we want to model that uh, does person uh, uh, own a car or or use public transportation and suppose that uh, that um, value of one indicates that uh, the person owns a car and value of zero is that the person doesn't own a car so then there must be some kind of underlying some kind of uh, uh, kind of latent utility of owning a car so so it might depend on some factors that, uh, for example, how long distance there is between home and uh, and and uh, and uh, work. For example, do you need to uh, also commute to multiple uh, sites during your working day? Is is there? Do you have some kind of hobbies that require a car? Uh, on the other hand, there might be also like how fa well functioning the public transportation network is that if you are like uh, living near the railroad track or or subway track or or subway station or or there's um, very well connected bus routes for example then perhaps you don't need a car uh, there might be situation that uh, do you have children or not and so on and so on what is your income level many many different uh, different uh, influencing factors that uh, then might might then influence your choice that whether you have a car or not and um, this kind of then this, uh, these factors that influence the choice of the transportation mode would be then these uh, variables x. So you could have this kind of then this latent regression model that, uh, for example, that, uh, that how many children you have, what is your income level, what is the distance between home and work. And this kind of uh, factors x could be then part of this latent regression model. But uh, here the catch is that, uh, that uh, we do not actually observe this uh, net benefit. Uh, this y asterisk is unobserved, but rather we observe this uh, discrete outcome that whether the person has a car or not. 
So then, of course, there's always some kind of uh, unobserved, uh, unobserved factors that, for example, some person just might uh, very much enjoy driving a car. Another person would perhaps uh, be scared of driving a car, on the other hand, and this kind of, uh, kind of factors we wouldn't observe. So those would be then in this uh, error term epsilon. Okay. So then to, to formalize this connection between this, uh, our latent regression model, which we cannot directly estimate because this kind of net, uh, net uh, utility or net benefit is, is not really directly observable, then uh, we resort to this kind of uh, probabilistic formulation that um, using this kind of rational uh, choice uh, that, uh, that, we, that we had uh, between this latent regression and this discrete outcome, then uh, we can say that the uh, probability that uh, this observed y is zero uh, means that, uh, that this uh, probability that this latent y asterisk is uh, less than or equal to zero. And then we can rephrase it in terms of this our, our um, error term epsilon. So that would require then that this, uh, this probability that the error term epsilon is less than or equal to minus beta 1 minus beta 2 times x. And uh, now we can then also then utilize this uh, cumulative distribution of, uh, of uh, distribution function f. So with distribution function f indicates exactly this probability that, uh, that epsilon is less than or equal to b minus beta 1 minus beta 2x. Uh, so that's the cumulative distribution f uh, in the point minus beta 1 minus beta 2 uh, times xi. And conversely, we know also that the cumulative distribution function has this property that, uh, that then the probability that, uh, that uh, yi is equal to 1 would be then uh, same as this uh, value of the cumulative distribution function in point uh, beta 1 plus beta 2 uh, times xi. It's otherwise, it's, it's 1 minus uh, cumulative distribution in point minus beta 1 minus beta 2 times xi. So we can use this cumulative distribution function or the value of the cumulative di distribution function in this uh, deterministic part of the latent regression model to indicate the probability that the outcome is equal to 1. Uh, notice also that by, by using these properties of the cumulative distribution function, it's also the expected value of y. So expected value of this binary outcome y is also equal to this value of the cumulative distribution function. So you can also then, if, if this uh, does not look very familiar, you can just uh, remind yourself about the properties of the cumulative distribution functions in general to see that this kind of uh, properties hold. So now what is the idea here is that uh, we have this kind of uh, regression model built inside this, uh, this uh, cumulative distribution function. And to gain more intuition, then I have... Uh, prepared this kind of graphical illustration. So think about this as a, as a single regression case. So the, the x variable is this uh, horizontal axis like usually, and uh, the dependent variable y is on the vertical axis as usually. So now when we have this kind of binary response model, then notice that now this uh, uh, y variable can only take values of zero or one. So the situation looks like this uh, uh, red colored diamonds in this kind of scatter plot. So, so this is the usual kind of scatter plot that I have used in the previous lessons, but now the scatter plot will look like this. And of course it will be like clustered then to this kind of, if also the X variable might be discrete, then it would be then also very heavily clustered. But the main point is that our dependent variable Y can only take these two values of zero and one. Okay, so instead of fitting here this kind of linear regression line to this kind of data, which, uh, which wouldn't make a lot of sense because then, yeah, then um, it, it, would, uh, um, it would get this kind of negative values very likely or values greater than one. So the idea with this binary response models is that uh, uh, we use this kind of uh, uh, latent regression equation inside this kind of cumulative distribution function. So I have now indicated the, as an example, the cumulative distribution function with this, this uh, black colored uh, sort of S-shaped line here. 
So this S-shaped line indicates this cumulative distribution function that we are trying to fit to the data. And with this beta 1 and beta 2 parameters, uh, we can then uh, control the location of this, uh, this so, so how far to the, we could shift this, uh, this uh, S-shaped curve to the left or to the right, and we can also make it flatter or more, more steeper, but anyway, it will maintain this kind of, kind of S-shape. So cumulative distribution function must be always, of course, uh, monotonic increasing, so it cannot go down, it's just increasing. But with these parameter values, then what we fit this model to the data, we can then, then um, uh, indeed the location, we can shift it to the left or to the right and, and how steep this, uh, this function is. But it always will have this kind of, kind of uh, nice S shape when we fit it to the data. So this is what we, have in, in, in a graphical illustration, this is how you can think about this kind of binary response model. So we fit this kind of uh, S-shaped uh, cumulative distribution functions to this kind of binary data. Okay, I hope that helps to illustrate. So then let's come to the so-called probit model. So, so what does the probit model do? So in order to estimate this kind of, kind of, um, Kind of model then, then with the maximum likelihood estimation we need some kind of uh, specify some parametric distribution for the for the um, error term epsilon and we talk about the probit model uh, when we use the maximum likelihood framework and we estimate the, uh, under the assumption that this epsilon is uh, normally distributed and in fact uh, we can harmlessly assume not just it's normally distributed, but it has the standard normal distribution. So we can harmlessly assume that the expected value of epsilon is zero, and it has a constant variance of one. Because in some sense, this variance doesn't really, really matter. This kind of properties are, are part of the latent regression model, which in fact, uh, which in fact is, uh, is uh, anyway, anyway, just kind of, um, uh, some kind of harmless standardization that doesn't really affect anyway, anything anyway. So therefore, then we can replace this uh, capital F, this cumulative distribution function, by this uh, symbol phi, which is uh, commonly used to indicate that we have now this uh, standard normal distribution with the with the mean zero and variance of one. Okay. So. Then we need to resort to the maximum likelihood estimation. Having, having specified that, so then we can then uh, specify what is the maximum likelihood estimator. So what's the log likelihood then? And uh, there also we need to have this um, IID assumption that, uh, that uh, these uh, observations are identically and independently distributed. So this epsilon comes always from the same, same uh, uh, zero one normal distribution. Okay, so then having this kind of kind of properties of then this uh, uh, connection between the latent regression model and this uh, this uh, binary outcomes that we de developed earlier, then uh, we can we can think about the likelihood likelihood function the following way. So notice that we know exactly that the probability of uh, of uh, y equal to one was this kind of uh, a value of the cumulative distribution function in point uh, beta 1 plus beta 2 times x. And then in the case that y is equal to 0, it was uh, also this value of the cumulative distribution function, but now in point minus beta 1 minus beta 2 times x. So to construct the log likelihood function, then we could take this product over, 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 this, uh, over those observations where y is equal to 1, and, uh, and use this uh, known cumulative distribution function. And then we can, we can uh, take this other subsample where y is equal to zero and use this other value, this, uh, this uh, value of the cumulative distribution function in minus beta one minus beta two times x. Okay, so notice that we have here uh, partitioned the sample in these two parts, those where this y is equal to one and those that y is equal to zero. And then we apply this uh, uh, corresponding value of the cumulative distribution function to model those probability that uh, those specific observations get this uh, value of zero or value of one. So it might be that uh, 
that, uh, that uh, based on this observed profile of X variables, uh, a person would be very likely to own a car, but actually we, we observe that uh, he or she doesn't own a car. And there might be some individuals the way we observe that uh, a person should not really own a car, but, but actually does. But, but uh, yeah, this is then we, we will then, then fit these values of beta 1 and beta 2 to, to make this kind of probability, uh, in some sense, explain these observed uh, discrete choices uh, as, as, as closely as possible. So then remember what, from the previous video lesson that usually we don't really work with this kind of uh, local likelihood function, but we take logarithms to, to transform it to the log likelihood function. And this is what I have, uh, have done here. So then we can then we can take the logarithms of those uh, cumulative distribution function and then sum over those uh, uh, subsamples of uh, y equal to one and y equal to zero. Okay. So then, in the case of the linear regression model, having specified the log likelihood function, then we proceeded to differentiate. And of course, for the sake of exercise, we could do it also in the case of this probit model. However, it turns out that uh, in this case, there's not really, not really uh, a nice uh, closed form solution. So typically the probit model is actually solved by using numerical methods. So in some sense, we are trying different values of betas and then, then see how, it, uh, how, it, uh, how, it, how this log likelihood responds. So there are some, some computational algorithms to, to solve it numerically. And uh, for example, this is how in Stata it is, it is uh, calculated. I will give you a short and, shortly an illustrative example. So you can then uh, estimate, for example, this kind of probit model in Stata. Uh, I'm sure there's also R packages available for probit model, but uh, for example, in Excel, you cannot, cannot uh, use it without some kind of uh, separate package. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> so let me illustrate them with the, with the example coming back to this our uh, hedonic modeling of housing market in the case of the probit. So so we had of course several discrete variables in the in the in the data set, and uh, I have chosen in here this uh, uh, try to explain the the probability that the apartment is in good condition with some explanatory variables such as uh, uh, size of apartment and year of construction and number of bedrooms and uh, which district it is uh, located at. And I also use the dummy variable that is their sauna. And uh, I will then use this example to also compare the results of, of probit and logit regression. But first of all, to illustrate the, the probit regression. And uh, we earlier used this uh, this housing market data of Espo, but this uh, this particular sample is actually the uh, center of Helsinki. Okay. So here, this uh, condition good is now now just binary. So then condition satisfactory or, or weak are then then this uh, taking values of zero. So this is then how the how the data stata results would look like so as i mentioned this uh, this is now uh, numerically solved so so you notice in the top part of this uh, slide some iteration zero iteration one two three four so this is kind of this uh, uh, numerical optimization you also see how this value of the log likelihood uh, um, gets larger and larger notice that this log likelihood function has some negative value so absolute value gets smaller but uh, it actually gets bigger when this uh, when this uh, uh, this uh, absolute value gets smaller, and eventually it reaches the the optimal solution of uh, of minus uh, one hundred thirty three point uh, nine six something. Okay, so you don't have this usual kind of ANOVA decomposition of the R, this OLS estimator, but now it is in this uh, maximum likelihood framework. Um, However, notice that for this uh, latent regression part, we have this kind of similarly, this coefficient standard errors and then some test statistics. Now it's not the t-test, but it's, uh, it's uh, indicated as the z-test. But there's also p-value that you can read in the same way as before in the case of OLS, and there is 95% confidence interval. 
So even when we move beyond the OLS regression, the similar kind of regression output we can, we can also see in this kind of maximum likelihood estimation. So then we have this, uh, these coefficients that, for example, we see that uh, uh, in this sample, uh, for example, this uh, dummy variable of sauna has a positive coefficient. So that would indicate that uh, if there is sauna in the apartment, it is more likely to be also, also in, a, in a good condition. And uh, it's also statistically significant. We see that the p-value is uh, quite small, 0 0.003. And uh, this is perhaps in the, in the when, when, we, when this uh, sample is taken uh, uh, from the center of Helsinki, so usually there the uh, apartment buildings are quite old. So if, there, if there's a sauna in the apartment, then it also means that it has been uh, renovated in the past uh, past few decades. Uh, then we find there also also that uh, that uh, for example some some district like Kluvi has uh, has significant and positive impact that may be related that uh, that uh, there is perhaps newer apartments. Uh, although this uh, this uh, year of construction didn't have really really significant impact on the on the on the probability of apartment being in good condition. So I hope that really illustrates you that how to how you can uh, use this kind of kind of probit model and how to read those results. So now now it is kind of factors that influence the probability of of a dependent variable y being being equal to one. Okay, so that that's so far. I'll come back to the probit model a little bit later. But what is then this uh, this sort of logit model and how that that differs from the from the probit model? So firstly, what is similar? Actually, everything is almost similar in the logit model as in the probit model. Uh, however, the main difference concerns this uh, parametric distribution for the error term epsilon. So remember that in the probit model, it is always assumed that uh, epsilon is uh, uh, normally distributed uh, uh, with the mean zero and and standard deviation and variance of one, but of course this normality assum assumption is somewhat uh, arbitrary. So uh, any other <laughs> other parametric assumption would be of course also equally arbitrary, uh, but sometimes it may be may be convenient to resort to the so-called logistic distribution. So the choice of the distribution in this uh, this case is is mainly done for the convenience rather than that whether there is some, some inherent reason why the epsilon should be normally distributed or, or following the logistic distribution. So notice that the logistic distribution uses this exponential function. So there is this uh, uh, formula of the cumulative distribution of the, of the logistic distribution. So for example, for the analytical derivations, it might be convenient to have this kind of logistic distribution rather than normal distribution that has a bit more tedious uh, uh, distribution function. So that may be one reason for the, for the use of the logistic distribution. Um, it's also quite com common to have the logistic distribution if you have so-called uh, um, multi multinomial logic, for example. So if we have uh, multiple levels in this, for example, in this housing, market example, we have this condition of apartment could be uh, good satisfactory or weak. So there's three different levels. So, so then, then we could also model that kind of situation with the, with the logistic distribution. And uh, sometimes this uh, logistic uh, distribution case is, is literally called logistic regression uh, that also is abbreviated as logit. So I use this term logit. Uh, and and it's it's kind of like probit versus versus logit is kind of kind of similar similar sounding abbreviations. Okay, so but only thing that differs here is just this uh, choice of the parametric distribution. Everything what I was telling about the the um, this latent regression interpretation, uh, the derivation of the model, everything is exactly the same here. Just the different uh, distribution. And uh, if you look at then this uh, housing market example, I have for sake of comparison uh, run also here this uh, uh, logit model with the, with the same kind of uh, uh, 
explaining condition good of this Helsinki housing market the data and with the same explanatory variables. So you will see that uh, uh, that uh, of course these coefficients will be will be uh, somewhat different and of course standard errors everything will look look a little bit different. But if you compare the signs of the coefficient, uh, um, I think all of the signs are exactly the same. And also statistical significance appears to be more or less the same. So there's not really really any any huge difference whether you use the, the logistic distribution or the normal distribution in this, uh, this example and in, in most examples that I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, for the sake of like robustness check, for example, you might might run both and compare the compare the results. So of course, if the one distribution gives completely different results than the other, then then perhaps then then there might be some reason for concern that then then the results are so uh, so sensitive on the specific parametric distribution. So then. One thing that I want to still talk about with probit and logic, and, and, and this is quite important for the interpretation of the result, is the so-called marginal effect. So, of course, in the normally in the linear regression model, those coefficients uh, beta are directly the marginal effects. So you can you can then then estimate the slope coefficients, and in the linear model, those are directly the marginal effect of uh, of of x and y. But this is no longer the situation in the in the case of the of the probit and logit models. So therefore, this kind of parameter estimates uh, uh, are not so do not have so kind of uh, um, direct interpretation. So um, of course, it might be then more important to 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 or more interesting to look at. Okay, what is the marginal effect of x on the probability that y is equal to one? And uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, what actually is the marginal effect in this kind of binary response uh, models? So I have then um, returned back to this kind of graphical illustration that I presented before to, to try to illustrate it. So, so um, remember here, these observed data are these uh, red colored diamonds. And uh, with probit or logit, we would fit this kind of S-shaped black curve. So for given observation, then uh, this uh, marginal effect would be would be uh, could be interpreted as the as the partial derivative or, or the slope of this of this uh, uh, black curve in a given point. So this is what I have tried to illustrate here with this uh, with this red line. So notice that the, that this uh, uh, slope of the of the of the derivative function of this of this black uh, uh, distribution function, of course, it changes as as x changes, so it's no longer constant. If you think about the rationale of it, so so if we go start from the very sm small values of x, so if we have a, consider for example this point where x is equal to one, okay, so there is this uh, this very low value of x, and the probability distribution function is also like close to zero. So marginal increase in the value of x wouldn't really make much of a difference to the to the to whether we have cho choose one or zero. So there is like very marginal. So so um, if I if I think about for example this uh, uh, choice of car transportation. So so uh, so if you have very very good uh, public transportation options and uh, suppose that your income level is low and you do not have children then a marginal change in some gasoline price wouldn't really make any difference to your choice of the buying a car for example so so this would be like a, when the when the value of x is low there's not not many much much impact on this uh, choice of zero or one then when we move to this kind of more critical region so so in this example with this uh, x equal to four, for example, would be would be very very large marginal impact. If it is, uh, if you think about moving from three to four or four to five, then there is a dramatic change in the probability of of uh, of one. So this is where this kind of x variables really matter. So so they can they can make a difference in this in this rational choice. And then on the other hand, if you go to these values of seven eight. So, so moving from seven to eight, again, 
it's very likely that uh, y is already equal to 1 if you have reached the value of 7 in, in x variable. So moving from 7 to 8 or, or marginal increase at the point 7, uh, there is very, very small probability that there's any, any change because uh, it's extremely likely that y is already equal to 1. So I hope that this discussion illustrates that uh, why this kind of uh, marginal effect is no longer constant in this kind of binary response models. So first it is uh, close to zero, then there is uh, a region where this, uh, this matters very much, and then again it is like no impact whatsoever. <coughs> so there is also if you then uh, take uh, take the derivative of this uh, of this cumulative distribution function f with respect to x. So notice that uh, this is then the formal way to derive the the marginal effect. So using the rules of the differential calculus, then we find that the, that the marginal effect in fact is the value of the density function in the point b beta one plus beta two times x multiplied by beta two. So this also illustrates that the marginal effect is no longer constant beta 2, but it also depends on this density function. And in the probit model, for example, this density function is, is, is indeed this kind of a bell-shaped curve, which is close to zero in both tails and, uh, and has the highest value in the, in the expected value of, of, the, of the x. So that's good to keep in mind that this marginal effect is no longer constant in this probit and, and logit models. Same applies also <coughs> for the logistic distribution. So here this, uh, this uh, density function f could be the density function of the standard normal distribution in the case of probit or the density function of the logistic distribution in the case of logit. So then we have a challenge when because this marginal effect is not constant so how do we how do we report it so we normally we cannot really report that for the each and every observation the common common approach also also available in stata is to then report it for the sample average of x another possibility would be to calculate it for each and every observation and then average but normally in, it's it's used to be we calculate the sample average of x and then calculate the, the marginal effect. So then it is like a, like a marginal effect on the average of, of x. And uh, this can be done, for example, in, uh, in uh, Stata automatically. So there is this MFX compute, so you can calculate the marginal effects. Uh, so, so I think these marginal effects can, can have much more intuitive interpretation than then if you look at this, for example, that what is the marginal effect that of one additional square meter or, or one additional bedrooms uh, uh, on, the, on the probability that the apartment is in, in good on the condition. So, so then you at least get some kind of sense of the, what is the magnitude of this, uh, of this, um, of these explanatory variables on, the, on this binary outcome. <clears throat> so for example, then, if you have this dummy variable for sauna, then then uh, then uh, given the sample average, so of course, even though this uh, uh, binary variable of sauna is itself it, because it's binary that this marginal effect is uh, is uh, is just the same for all observations, but uh, but it also depends on these other variables, these continuous variables. So so if you calculate that. Uh, for the average apartment in the in this sample, what is the marginal effect of this discrete change that uh, that, uh, that that there is sauna or there is not sauna? So so then for the average observation, then uh, then uh, having a sauna in apartment would then increase the probability uh, of good condition by uh, forty three percentage points. Okay, so that's quite a quite a large increase in the in the probability that uh, that the apartment is in a good condition. For the sake of comparison, we can also compute the marginal effect for the for the logic logit regression. And notice here when we compare these uh, marginal effects, these uh, marginal effects are much more similar between probit and logit than those original coefficients that we had. So this is simply because also this uh, 
parameterization, whether we use the normal distribution or logistic distribution, so this alternative uh, parametric uh, distribution assumption. Um, it doesn't matter so much for this for these marginal effects than it matters for this original coefficient. So, for example, let's look at this uh, impact of sauna. So we have here zero point four three five nine, and in the probit it is zero point four three four two. So it is in the fourth decimal place. This this difference. Okay, so. By comparing those, you can you can verify that also for the other variables, uh, especially of course those that are statistically significant. You would expect that this marginal effect is are much more much more similar. So indeed, this these uh, marginal effects have much more intuitive interpretation in the in this kind of binary response models. So finally, then, um, what about the empirical fit? So. Uh, for example, if you look at this data output, then you cannot even find this usual R squared statistic, the coefficient of uh, um, coefficient of determination is the official name. So some alternatives, of course, we could use this uh, optimal log likelihood function value. That's especially if you want to compare, for example, uh, um, probit versus logit, but of course, then, then uh, this kind of specific parameterization also also matters. So in general, that's not really so easy to interpret when we have such kind of minus uh, 133 or something. What does it really mean? So therefore, there is the so-called uh, pseudo R squared statistic, uh, uh, which is uh, which is just defined as as one minus uh, the log likelihood uh, function of the model divided by log likelihood function of this called L zero which is just the model which only includes the constant term. So in that sense, if you do not include any information of the explanatory variables, then what would be the value of the log, log likelihood function of just the constant term? So this gives this kind of uh, uh, bit similar to the R squared statistic, but it's not actually exactly the same as the usual kind of OLS uh, ANOVA decomposition based uh, R squared. But it can be then, then more, more easily used for comparing the empirical field. Another possibility, of course, when we have this binary response model, you could, of course, make this kind of uh, two times two matrix like we had for this uh, type one and type two errors earlier. So, so you check those, uh, those, um, those uh, lecture slides, for example. So, so whether the model is predicting correctly or not. So you could have, for example, a uh, number of observations that uh, that uh, uh, y equal to one is correctly predicted and now how many of times it is uh, wrongly predicted and same for this y equal to zero. Or you could have percentages that how many correct and wrong predictions you have in the, in the data. So that could give some kind of idea that, uh, that uh, does, for example, probit or logit model then, then uh, tend to over predict or under predict these, uh, these uh, values of zero or values of one. So that can be also also useful, but uh, that's not at least uh, in my impression automatically part of the of the Stata package. So I have here this um, uh, again coming back to this uh, probit model in this uh, hedonic housing market example. So I have here it's a circled with the with the with the red uh, red red color those uh, uh, value of the log likelihood function. Uh, as I mentioned, this kind of minus uh, hundred. Uh, 133 is not really very intuitive to inter interpret, so that's why there is this pseudo R square 0 0.07. But again, for that also, there is not really some kind of uh, uh, threshold that what is really good fit or not. So actually, if you want to more then, then uh, approach it more systematically from the perspective of statistical text, so there is this above this pseudo R square, uh, perhaps I should circle that one as well. So there is this uh, LR, so that refers to the likelihood ratio test uh, with this kind of G-squared uh, uh, statistic. So you could compare this uh, value of 20.58 to the, to the G-squared distribution with uh, 9 degrees of freedom. And below that, there is this uh, probability value. So that's the p-value of this uh, likelihood ratio test. So this p-value 0 0.0146 right above this uh, pseudo R squared. So that's the p-value for the 
for the uh, joint significance test of this probit regression. So you can use that kind of likelihood ratio test to test that is this uh, module jointly uh, jointly significant or not, and that would be kind of a, kind of a systematic way of seeing that is it is it. Uh, um, is it, does the model have good empirical fit or not? So in some sense, that is, is it jointly significant or not would be a good way. And that's, that's kind of more, more comparable to the, to the F test, uh, perhaps than even this R squared statistic versus pseudo R squared. So, and that can be also, also in the, in the, in the, uh, logit model, you get similar kind of, uh, kind of likelihood ratio test there. So I think that completes the discussion of this kind of binary response models. Uh, as the next next topic, uh, I will use so-called Tobit model, which which then refers to the case where the uh, where we have censored or truncated dependent variables. So in that sense, the Tobit model might be seen as some kind of intermediate case between the with, between the probit and uh, and linear regression. Thanks for your attention and see you on the next uh, next video.